know it was last week that we had a symposium, and it seems like we've already had an entire lecture series in a semester. Um, and so I think that tonight we're, we're building off of the great success of last weekend and uh, being able to kind of introduce to you our fall lineup of lecture guests. Um, not since 2011, we have a Plum professor in residency that has taken over our lecture series. And so, uh, for those of you who haven't met Suchi Reddy, this semester's Plum professor, uh, she just she did just that. And so, when we were negotiating and talking about how we want to set the courses this semester, uh, it was very much a part of what she wanted um, was to bring in a series of guests who would contribute a way of thinking and a way of being. Um, that would add to the life of the school and the courses that we're teaching. And so, uh, Julio was, was definitely the kind of first choice in this. And uh, next we have Colin Ellard and then Sergey Gepstein coming in. Um, so, for those of you who don't know Julio, Julio Bermudez is a, he directs the Sacred Space and Cultural Studies uh, program at the Catholic University um, in Washington, D.C. Before that, he taught, at the, taught in Utah. Um, he's been teaching for over 30 years, and his interests are focused on the relationship between space, or between architecture, culture, and spirituality through the lens of phenomenology. And we've been having a great conversation all day about phenomenology and our past professor, Johanny Palaz. Um, and of course, he's, he's in demand for lecturing, um, and has done so all over, uh, and published two books on this, um, Transcending Architecture, Contemporary Views, on sacred space and architecture, culture, and spirituality. And his current work, which we're going to see tonight, is um, part of a 15-year research project book that's going to be coming out. Um, it uh, covers extraordinary architecture experiences that enable access to the transcendent. And so, for, for me, I think that's a really interesting um, notion and uh, finding the transcendent in architecture. Who's committed to these things? And uh, so, please welcome Julio Zanunas. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Suchi, for uh, making my, my, my um, being here possible. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. You know, of all the things you could do, of all the things you could do, you choose to be here. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so um, this talk lasts about 50 minutes or so, and it has four parts, so you know what you're up to. Um, and it's very close to my heart. It's a book that I'm writing. And it's the first time I do this lecture, so we'll see how it goes. Um, and I read it not out of lack of respect to you, but the opposite, because I want to be precise. And hopefully uh, the narrative um, matches the images. So really, if you see the images, you see what I'm trying to say. So even if you don't understand what I'm saying for my English <laughs> accent, you still understand the, the, the images. Some say that in certain situations, architecture is capable of delivering us to the most, our most touching, ecstatic, insightful, memorable, or transcending moments in our lives. References to such extraordinary events exist in the architectural lore. Take, for instance, Wolle Corbusier, one of the most influential architects of the 20th century, calls experience of ineffable architecture. According to him, architecture has the astonishing capacity to, quote, efface the walls, drive away contingent presences, open up a boundless death, and offer limitless escape." End of quote. Le Corbusier was on his path towards coining this term when he assertively explained how this seemingly miraculous moment may come to pass. In his manifesto book, Towards a New Architecture, he says that great buildings, and he points to the ancient Parthenon, profoundly move us because they align our inner core with the harmonic axis of the universe. Something possible because, and he says, quote, <clears throat> an undefinable trace of the absolute lies within our being, end of quote. So amazing the experience of ineffable space is that Le Corbusier, not a religion, religious person, compares it to spiritual states. Quote again, I am not conscious of the miracle of faith, but I often leave that of ineffable space, the consummation of plastic emotion, end of quote. 
If consummation seems like an extreme word to use to describe an architectural experience, then we need to consider that he's talking of reaching ultimate emotional fulfillment and complete wiping out from the mind of anything but the ecstatic situation itself. An extraordinary moment indeed. After recalling a story about the architectural student, an architectural student overwhelmed by his experience of the Pantheon, President AIA Chair Robert I.B. writes, quote, that storytelling took many of us in the audience back to our own moment of recognition, the fortunate transcendent instant when the universe clicked into adjustment and we understood the power of architecture. For some in the audience, the moment of architectural recognition might have occurred at the Salk Institute for another at Ronchamp. The route is an individual, inevitable one. Beside that intuitive understanding, all learning pales and light go dim." End of quote. Claudio Silvestrin, an international recognized architect practicing out of London, agrees with Ivy and Le Corbusier. He summarizes the most profound encounter with architecture thus, quote, when one actually sees the solidity of a mountain or the vastness of the sea, when one comes upon it suddenly, there it is in its monolithic presence. Everything, including one's own ego, has been pushed aside, except the majesty of that mountain or that sea. Such a sight absorbs you completely. It is beauty itself. If you are fortunate enough, think of a building that absorbs you with the same intensity. That building I call architecture. The others are nothing but edifices." End of quote. This is a video taken of, uh, of course, the Sack Institute on uh, Equinox. As you know, the sun uh, hits the end of the, of the water path. In describing his emotional responses to medieval cathedral, English poet, philosopher, and theologian Samuel Taylor Coleridge leaves little doubt that buildings may enable profound inspiration, access to metaphysical reality, and self-transcendence. In the early 19th century, he says, quote, Gothic art is sublime. On entering a cathedral, I'm filled with devotion and with awe. I'm lost to the actualities that surround me, and my whole being expands into the infinite. Earth and air, nature and art, all swell up into eternity, and the only sensible impression left is that I am nothing." End of quote. One hundred years later, German theologian Rudolf Otto recognizes that the, that the arts in general, and especially architecture, are able to deliver us, however momentarily, to the numinous. This is remarkable, a remarkable claim because Otto defines numinous as an encounter with a holy other, that is, a being that is so ultimately alien or beyond our humanity that can only be indirectly sensed through feelings. That is, non-rational means. In other words, we are told that architecture has the capacity to provide access to a divine, transcending power or God by inducing a special state of consciousness. Referring to the architecture historian, I cannot avoid mentioning architecture Louis Kahn. Who can forget his inspiring talk about the central importance of the unmeasurable in architecture? Quote, a great building must begin with the unmeasurable, must go through measurable means when it is being designed, and in the end, must be unmeasurable. End of quote. His multiple statements about this matter and his built legacy are a loud testimony that the ultimate function of architecture is to give access to some type of metaphysical or transcendental experience. The scholarship of comparative religion scholar Lindsay Jones brings more support to the potential of architecture to catapult us into extraordinary states. In his sort of two-volume books covering the phenomenology of sacred architecture, he states that once one accepts, I quote here, the alluring invitation of architecture, he or she can be profoundly transformed by it, by it in ways that are beyond one's control and powers of self-conscious deliberation. Such experience lifts one to higher levels of consciousness and spiritual awareness in ways that the ordinary acquisition of knowledge cannot. So much so that these events may cause transformations that entails 
Not simply new ways of thinking, but even new ways of being. Think of that. New ways of being. Adding to these striking claims are architectural theoretician Alberto Perez Gomez. In his book, Built Upon Love, he makes the case that architecture potentially offers, quote, a radical orientation and experience beyond words that has the, the power to change one's life in the present like magic or an erotic encounter, end of quote. When speaking of what the actual ex extraordinary moment may be like, he says, quote again, one experience is not an object of thought, but a superlative union comparable only to a human orgasm. This state of grace is shared by the mystic and the person I love. Life loses weight, we smile, and our gaze relaxes. The unknowing it reveals in, to our experiences is crucial for the construction of any truth." End of quote. These persuasive references are speaking of experiences that fall well beyond the ordinary. For our quotidian relationship with buildings hardly lead to total absorption, immediate access to deep understanding, loss of self-control, complete emotional fulfillment, instantaneous transformation of being, orgasmic fusion with the world, profound existential realization, or for that matter, God. But radically define our conventional ways to perceive, to feel, to think, and to intuit reality, these experiences must be defined as extraordinary. But as late scientist Carl Sagan always reminded us, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. In other words, is this real? Seeking such extraordinary evidence means to dive into the phenomenology of the architectural extraordinary, something that I did by pursuing three projects that I will share with you tonight. First, I went on to find as many testimonies about the extraordinary experiences from trustable sources in the public domain, where I just quote, they're not experiences, they are people talking about it. I wanted actual testimonies. This is the storytelling part of my talk. Second, I expanded phenomenology's traditional method of small-scale observation and hermeneutics to include very large number of accounts. This meant to design and conduct two large surveys. Third, and grounded in the survey result, I went to neuroscience to look at what is happening in the brain and their external experiences. Following again, I will share these projects with you. I started this project with great enthusiasm. Little I knew that it was going to be really hard to find testimonies. And again, what I quoted are not testimonies, are people talking about it. I wanted to see people say, no, yes, I did experience and this is what I felt. So next I will share four stories briefly from reliable sources. First is the story of 23-year-old Le Corbusier, not called Le Corbusier by then, at the Acropolis in September 1911. On the day of arriving to Athens, he decides to wait until late afternoon to visit the Acropolis. He recognizes being anxious and he climbs, as he climbs the hill to enter the citadel later that day. It is then, while crossing the propylaea, that the externality begins to unfold. And I quote now. As by the violence of, of a combat, I was stupefied by the, this gigantic apparition. Beyond the peristyle of the sacred hill, the Parthenon appeared alone and square, holding high up above, above the thrust of its bronze colored shafts, its entablature, its stone brow. Nothing existed but the temple, the sky, and the surface of paving stone damaged by centuries of plundering. Having climbed steps that were too high, not cut to human scale, I entered the temple on the axis, this is when you could enter it, you can't anymore, between the fourth and the fifth fluted shafts. And turning back all at once from this spot, once reserved for the gods and the priest, I took in a glance the entire blazing sea and the already obscure mountains of the Peloponnesus, soon to be beaten by the disk of the sun. The steep slope of the hill and the high elevation of the temple above the stone slab of the propylaea 
conceal from view all traces of modern life. And all of a sudden, 2,000 years of, are obliterated, a harsh poetry seizes you, dropping down onto one of those steps of time, head sunk in the hollow of your hand. You are stunned and shaken. This is what renowned Finnish architects and theoretician Yuhani Palasma that have been here before teaching with you had to say about his extraordinary experience. A powerful architectural experience is a shock, quote, I'm here, a shock, a fusion, and a cure, all at the same time. My consciousness of my separate ego is lost as I become the space and the space becomes me. The spaces between the terrifyingly massive and gigantic columns of the Karnak Temple in Luxor, Egypt, made me lose my sense of self as my mind fused with the space of the pharaohs. Gravity, matter, space, light, and silence fused into a singular dimension and I became part of this metaphysical modality of being, pure existence, the mere experience of the act of being devoid of substance and focus." End of quote. Gonzalo Rios Vizcarra, director of the School of Architecture at the Catholic University of Santa Maria in Arequipa, Peru, tell us of his incredible visit to Saint Chapelle in Paris about three years ago. Quote, it was little more than a wish wishful thinking to expect an experience of relative importance in an environment where everything conspired against it. The beautiful Gothic chapel where Louis IX of France, the saint, spent much of his life contemplating the relics from the Passion of Christ he had acquired was nothing short of desecrated, desecrated by a horde of tourists in search of the banal spectacle that they had probably experienced at Euro Disney the day before and were eager to replicate. Ready to leave the chapel, the overcast winter weather of Paris dissipated the clouds for a moment and ushered in rays of light that penetrated the atmosphere through the colorful stained glass windows, making their initial white light into an explosion of reds and blues, which by flooding everything created an atmosphere where any physical, inanimate, or living thing appear immaterial and belonging to the same substance. For a few seconds, everything seemed to stop, freeze in place. The hostile crowd was silenced by this condition, even if only superficially, and at least for the brief moment that the phenomenon lasted, intensified the impression of cohesion. This mystical space, trivialized by use, had done it again, despite the femirality of the phenomenon, or maybe because of it, usually. Invisible structures of the world were revealed to me, getting me in tune with the profound order of things that rule us all, a revelatory phenomenon propitiated by architecture. This is the last uh, testimony by Tadao Ando. He tells us of undertaking a personal journey to Europe in 1965. Instead of flying, he used the time-consuming and physical demanding waterland route through Asia. Ando confesses that at age 23, he was being pulled across the planet by the inspiration gained through the self-directed study of Le Corbusier's work. After his long Trans-Siberian train ride and spending some time in Scandinavia, he finally made his way into France. Here are the exact words Ando uses to describe his extraordinary experience. Quote, it was around the end of September that I arrived in Paris. The first thing was to see Le Corbusier's architecture. Taking different trains from Paris for two or three hours, I found the church on top of a small hill in Ronchamp. With great anticipation and excitement, I approached the architecture from below, first glimpsing a part of the roof. It seemed that a giant seashell, such a mollusk or a crab loom in the hill, such a mysterious impression struck me. Trying to hold my excitement, I stepped into the church and positioned myself in the light streaming in from the opening, openings irregularly scattered across the Atlantic wall. Light of various intensities and colors, red, blue, and yellow, came in from different angles and drawing sharp contours on the floor. They clashed intensely. 
because of their overwhelming spatial experience which penetrated deep into my soul, I had to escape after staying less than one hour. I was always struck by a light unprecedented in my life." End of quote. Despite their trustworthy sources and consistency, public testimony like this are too few and far apart. In fact, I shall share with you a third of all that I have been able to find and collect in a decade and with help, not just myself. Why is there such remarkable silence about something that seems so significant? Their scarcity should raise our attention, if not alarm us. It seems as we don't want to talk or to look open-mindedly onto this matter. But upon a second thought, however, it should not surprise us. For such rare and precious confessions, and they are, they are nothing but confessions, are summarily dismissed, if not ridiculed, by both the ideological right and left. Not to mention the practical professional and the smart academic. The disqualifying accusation range from New Age superficiality to nihilism, passing through sentimentalism, sacrilegiousness, and criticality, irrationalism, naivete, uselessness, irrelevancy, and you can go on and on. I was embarking in this project of collecting personal testimonies. I immediately realized that even if I got many, they would be totally dismissed by the rationalist or the skeptic or the empiricist. They would claim that the gathered accounts represent a few instances that cannot be objectively verified and therefore considered as genuine example of a real phenomenon. The only recourse left at my disposal at that point was to strategically request the help of science. In this case, it meant to gather a very large number of testimonies in order to tackle the situation collectively and validate the study through statistical significance. So, about 10 years ago, I conducted two large surveys online, one in English and the other one in Spanish, to gather information about people's extraordinary architectural experiences defined as, defined as this. Both surveys have the same 35 questions and, uh, that ask about the experience and the participant. Each survey took a minimum of 10 minutes to produce <clears throat> and, and was open and available over the internet. <clears throat> the survey produced the largest number of personal testimonies of such profound experiences of architecture ever collected, even to, to this day, nearly 2,900. A number that supports the study with statistical significance. The surveys soundly answer in the affirmative to these two questions. First is through popular participation. The strong wording behind the definition was not a deterrent to people's participation. Hence, we must assume that barring some massive misunderstanding, 2,272 individuals affirmed the actuality of these experiences. Regarding the, irrele the, rele the relevancy, nothing insignificant gets so many responses from people in our days, particularly when we are talking of a time-consuming and supervised survey that offers no rewards and deals with something most people consider esoteric of, of no use. Second, their significance is supported by the reported level of impact, accounted as memory recall and transformative power. Nature reserves lasting memory only to those events that are significant in our lives. When asked about the vividness of recall of their experiences, the majority of respondents agreed that it was extremely vivid, 63%, with moderate, moderate vivid, a clear second at 34, and only 3% said they barely remember it. The importance of these experiences is made even more apparent when despite their reported rarity, 
over 60% of people indicated to have had only five of these in their entire lives. And their short duration, nearly 50% timed them at less than 30 minutes. Over 80% of the participants still rated these experiences to be as or more powerful than other very strong lab experiences. The survey requested participants to define five experiential characteristics of these exper extraordinary experiences using a list of eight words or entering up to three qualities of their own, which is the other category here. The, the chart that you see summarizes the result. It is impossible not to notice the incredible, incredible agreement between two large populations that are so far apart in space, language, and culture. The top four choices are identical, although in a slightly different order. The top ranking of the sensual, perceptual, and physical quality affirms the role that they embody, material, and observable plays in these unique events. This often called objective dimension has always been at the center of beauty and traditional, uh, traditional related to compositional, tectonic, and other empirical considerations. This descriptor also has an important association with the body. The high ranking of emotion is considered consistent with these experiences' powerful and lasting impact. Emotion is arguably the most important component in fixing events in memories, as said. Feelings are also instrumental in raising awareness, triggering and being triggered by strong body reactions, and provoking very intense, profound, and vivid perceptions and responses. Choosing timelessness to describe these experiences point at condition defying ordinary consciousness, with its unyielding movement from the past to the future. It implies a level of presence and awareness that has been slowed down to a standstill and in the afforded new perspective allows us to access an eternal moment of awe, peace, and otherworldly qualities. Paintings of Edward Hopper and Giorgio di Chirico comes to mind as seen depicting atmospheres of timeless instant. Pleasure recognizes the joy or satisfaction that results from experiencing architectural qualities. Whereas timelessness refers to disembodiment and the mind, pleasure, on the other hand, has sensual, visceral, and emotional connotations. By providing relief from our constant seeking to quench desire, pleasure delivers us into a state of exalted calm, often involving a pleasing and heightened appreciation of what is present. When asked to say what they got out of the experience, participants of both surveys agree to be insight, about 55%, beauty, over 40, 50%, joy, satisfaction, 43%, and peace, and peace, uh, 38%. Now, what type of insight, you may wonder? And I can confidently say that it has to do with an intuitive understanding of connectedness with being, life's meaning, what is real yet transcended, where architecture is, the ineffable. Notice that neither these insights nor the other three outcomes offer any practical or marketable utilization for concrete gain. They're useless, or not. Survey participants added that these experiences were surprising, 80%, sudden, 55%, spontaneous, over 80%, introspective and silent, 87%. These are huge percentage. And a high level of awareness than normal, 85%. They universally agree that the events were lived intensely, 80%, profoundly, 90%, vividly, 85%. Consistent with such description, more than 50% reported strong body reactions, that is goosebumps, heart pounding, shivers, even immobilization, and most remarkable, weeping. People cry, over 20% cried with these buildings. What kept coming up in different ways was that these experiences are not event characterized by analytical and uh, uh, intellectual activities. In fact, participants rank thinking, criticism, and other such mental operation in sixth and fifth place. Yet, this happened at no cost to the, to the experience. To the contrary, the event actually gains in intensity, depth, vividness, attention, 
and embodiment. These extraordinary experiences must be shutting down verbal functioning and simultaneously opening up other ways of knowing, feeling, and sensing beyond the left brain or the neocortex or discursive operation. As we will see in a minute, we'll see that uh, this is what we found in neuroscience. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that, the, that thought or analysis are irrelevant. Rather, it indicates that external experiences of architecture are not definable by thinking and related cerebral activities. Since it is hard, or if not impossible, to voluntarily fabricate such corporal or emotional responses, thinking appears to be a derivative of coming to turn to what is happening. This explains how weeping can take place, even when our society clearly disapproves the public display of strong emotions. The fact that one in five individuals in the English survey and one in three in the Spanish survey still cry demonstrate that these experiences are, by are bypassing cultural and intellectual, conscious and unconscious mechanism of censorship. Recognized art critic Jen Elkins has a wonderful and insightful discussion of this extreme phenomenology in his book, uh, Pictures and Tears. When using their own words, survey participants provided an unmistake, unmistakable indication of a non-knowledge-seeking, non-judgmental, and aesthetic experience. Results like the rest of the survey show a strong statistical parallel in Spanish, which is red, and English populations. All things considered, the survey provided clear evidence that extraordinary experiences of architecture were all about contemplative states and often involved strong spiritual components. And not just that. Looking at the top 10 buildings or places that provoke respondent profound experiences, probably the places you want to visit, we found not only well-known places for architects and the public in general, but also, and very relevant to this conversation, that most of these buildings were architecture designed for, with contemplation in mind. Contemplation that were religious or spiritual or ascetic or symbolic. And if this, is, if this list brings up well-known places, once we go lower um, in, the, in, the, in the list, it's a beyond, below the top 20 in English or the top 15 in Spanish, we find that at least a good half of the cited places are quite ordinary buildings. All this means that the high design, the design quality matters a lot, but also that personal attitude and connection to a place are of importance as well. It is then not surprising to find out that the average distance people reported traveling to get to the top 10 places were 3,400 miles in the English survey and 3,900 miles, um, 3, miles in Spanish. We are talking of continental distances involving big physical, temporal, economic, and cultural efforts on the traveler. The ancients knew it well, committed pilgrimage is the price to pay to encounter the extraordinary. Clearly, architectural quality cannot be learned from books or a lecture like this, but must be directly apprehended and tested in actual experience. After all, most of the respondents already knew, intellectually knew, that the, what these buildings were. And that's why they went. They spent all this money together because they knew the building. So why, why would we transform and surprise All these findings show that in the right conditions, architecture can become a gateway to extraordinary or transcendent moments. The agreement between the testimonials early presented and the survey results give us some assurance that we are capturing many of the elusive characteristics of these remarkable experiences. The surveys show that architecture may be successfully designed to induce extraordinary experiences. However, even with statistics in our side, we always have people rolling their eyes and declaring these experiences as ultimate subjective and therefore impossible to generalize. 
that attitude, which I hate, made me wonder if I, if I couldn't use neuroscience to prove them wrong or to prove me right. Hard fact. But, but this hard scientific approach demanded a more precise definition of extraordinary architectural experience. Rather than the survey findings, findings that these experiences are fundamentally contemplative, I decided to focus the study of architectural induced contemplation. I framed the scientific question like this. In other words, can an external method to induce contemplation, architecture, produce results similar to those attained using conventional internal methods like meditation or prayer? With this in mind, we conducted a, an fMRI pilot study that looked at the functional neuroanatomical differences between engaging contemplative buildings versus ordinary or non-contemplative buildings. Our experimental block, block B, consisted in showing subject visual images of five buildings set to induce contemplative states. And we used two controls. Our first control, block A, came from showing the same subject's images of five ordinary buildings not designed to elicit contemplative responses. The other control came from the neuroscience literature covering subjects either undergoing meditation or seeing aesthetic objects. We recruited 12 architects for the experiment. Choosing architects as such follows a rationale similar to selecting expert meditators to demonstrate the power of meditation in the laboratory. In our case, architects are most likely to have the strongest and therefore measurable responses to buildings than the average citizen. And we could talk more why all this is the way it is. You know, I don't have time now, but if you're interested, we could talk. <coughs> There were two questionnaires. One was given after each block and consisted of three self-assessment questions addressing level of anxiety, presentness, and internal dialogue. And the second questionnaire was done after finishing the fMRI scan and was um, 15 minutes long and in included questions about the variety of issues as uh, you can see in the slide. Let's, let us now move to the results. First, in terms of self-assessment, contemplative buildings were found to significantly reduce anxiety and mind-wandering or internal dialogue, a result that is consistent with moving from an ordinary mental state to one of contemplation. A visual summary of the responses to four exit questions show unmistakable distinctions between the control and the experiment, demonstrating that during contemplative architecture, subjects arrived to a state of mind that was ascetic and contemplative. Responses to yet another four questions define the type of attention deployed during each block. As we can see, there is again very obvious differences. Whereas the control block elicited a distracted and inwardly directed attention that is consistent with higher level of mind wandering and anxiety, the experiment overwhelmingly provoked absorbed and outwardly focused conscious states that are consistent with high concentration and aesthetic appreciation. Now let us move to the fMRI results. In this first exhibit, we see the activation of the whole brain in comparison to the baseline. While there are some differences between the control and the experiment, uh, what is important here are the commonalities, as they emphasize what is unique to the architectural experience in general, vision and movement, or, or the premotor and the visual processing centers of the brain which produces an embodied and perceptual rich state of awareness and being. This is architecture on the brain. Huh? The observation of the prefrontal cortex, which we are told, is the center of all our executive function, sense of self, analysis, uh, thinking, criticism, where the West tells us who we are, shows uh, a, re a relative lack of activation in the experiment compared to the control. Comparatively speaking, the prefrontal cortex is silent during the experience of contemplative building. This is consistent with meditative state with, when self-narrative activities, evaluation, analysis, memory, all the stuff that goes in the head, dependent on the frontal lobe, right here, are basically shut down. 
But we are seeing much, much less activation than expected, even under internal induced contemplation. We must remember that traditional meditation, and those of you that have done this know, demands uh, to engage the, the, your frontal cortex to regulate the deployment and maintenance of attention. The attention wanders, so you have to keep bringing it back, right? In our case, the power of the stimulus, our architecture, attains the same effect without demanding subject any effort. Think about it. No effort. And you're in a contemplative state. We, dis we observe a differential activation of the inferior parietal lobe during the experiment. This is important because this region integrates somatosensory neurological activity, directs certain aspects of attention, and holds our body image in the environment. Really important. This result suggests a more comprehensive, synthetic, and, at and attentive engagement of the experience than the control. This interpretation is consistent with the sense of atmosphere, wholeness, and totality the subject reported in the exit questionnaire regarding contemplative architecture. Now let us consider anxiety and architecture. We expected that anxiety, anxiety would narrow down awareness and raise negative feelings. It would turn attention inwardly to the psychology of the self and away from an architecture, thus fostering internal dialogue and distraction. In other words, anxiety would remove the person from the experience, would kill contemplation. And this is exactly what happens in the control. Since the brain areas af affected by anxiety, which I won't list here, are important for environmental engagement, anxiety being weakens the architectural experience in general and undermines the possibility of attaining contemplative state in ordinary buildings. Now, something very odd happened when we consider the role of anxiety in contemplative buildings. Looking at the positive regression, um, we find that the activation of the classroom and the visual cortex increases as rating of anxiety increases. This seems to go against what we would expect. A stressful situation should actually break down our synchronization and integration of sensory information, because we were just in our head, and probably diminish visual attention and activation because of what I just said. So what's happening? The reason why anxiety fails to undermine the experience of contemplative architecture is because these buildings are so engaging that they demand a high level of synchronization and integration of sensory information. In other words, the architecture induces a contemplative state that calms the subject by directing their attention more intently to the beautiful spaces and form in front of them. And this happens, again, naturally and effortlessly. In a way, there is nothing new. After all, isn't this why we often go to a museum or a church or a beautiful place to calm ourselves? Our research provides neuroscience evidence of the power that design environments may have on people. And the last result I'll show today about my neuroscience work is perhaps the most compelling. Or at least, I think so. Based on subject responses to all our questions and using the parameters listed in this slide, we rank our subjects' depth of experience. The ranking goes from subjects having a superficial and intellectual response to the experiment to very, very deep, absorbed, and emotional experiences. What we wanted to see was if there was any correlation between this variability in experiential responses and brain activation. Using, using such ranking of subjects, we did a regression analysis and found a progressive, massive deactivation of the brain the deeper the contemplative states. Specifically, the more profound the architecture experience, the less activation of the prefrontal cortex, which, as we know, is associated with self-thinking analysis, etc. Less activation of areas central to the default mode network of the brain, which is said to basically run as 24-7. It's called the default network, network, a variety of parts of the brain that are in, in association. The activation of areas concerned with audit, auditory experiences, with labeling and understanding things, linguistic processing, calculation, and deductive reasoning. All that part of the brain is shut down. And at the same time of this massive deactivation, there is an upregulation, a, a superactivation, of area associated with sensory motor operations supporting the aesthetic absorption with the stimulus. And all this happened 
asking us for no effort. We are basically seeing a brain that goes silent the more contemplative it gets through architecture. This discovery, in addition to the rest of findings, make our study, I think, remarkable. We can attain a contemplative state with architecture without putting any effort. Such contemplative outcome coming from the aesthetic experience of architecture finds agreement with results from neuroscience studies of other state of consciousness that may be also considered extraordinary in their own right. And I'll name three of them very briefly, which as I name it, you will realize the relationship. One is our uh, peak experiences and flow states. In, in psychology, they have uh, studied these states uh, and they have found that, for instance, they demand attentive, att full attentive absorption, high emotional and pleasurable results with neural correlates that, are, that shut down the front, frontal cortex and high activation of the motor and sensory centers. Similar neural and experiential signature are reported in neuroscience studies of contemplative state gained through yoga practice and deity visualization in Buddhism. Research of altered state of consciousness and psychedelics, in particular, also show parallels with results of our pilot studies, such as the massive deactivation of neural network, particularly the prefrontal cortex, but also but, uh, the activation of other much less used in ordinary life. Lastly, there are investigators pointing at the apparent um, a similarity between extraordinary aesthetic responses and spiritual and mystical states in terms of experiences and brain activation. Are we still here? The most expensive things of all, the hardest thing of all, is to remain attentive. It's the hardest thing. That's why we live in an attention economy, they say. This is. We have considered the power of architecture to induce profound, even life altering moments. Moments in which a building geometrical proportion turns into shivers, a stone into tears rituals into insights, light into a spiritual longing, a space into contemplation, and time, time into heightened presence. Moments when the opacity hiding life's meanings suddenly evaporates so we capture a revelatory glimpse. Certainly, not everyone has experienced architecture this way, but those that have, as we saw, speak of such moments as almost miraculous. We also saw, very briefly, how our discipline, our discipline avoids this matter, even though there is plenty of evidence of its reality, and we need to change the situation. My work, I hope, tries to move in that direction by gathering examples and analyzing these extraordinary experiences through a variety of means. But my intention is not only to advance our understanding, but also to express my, hopefully, our gratitude and to celebrate such unforgettable gifts. My hope is that the courageous example of those sharing their testimony and the incipient science supporting its factual basis encourage us all to bring our most unique and valuable moments with architecture into the open. Perhaps most important, I hope that we architectural designers, architectural teachers, architectural students, don't need to feel guilty or provide silly excuses to seek to create conditions that foster such moment of grace. Which brings me to the last part, which is very short. Two examples of possible applications. So, you know, we are designers. Who cares about all the talk, you know? What do you do with this stuff? So based on medical and scientific research of the past 20 years, we know now of the many, many health benefits, psychological, social, organic, that contemplative practice brings to human beings. We know that. But we also know that it's hard to get people to practice contemplation because it demands time, training, commitment, and effort. Something most of us are not too willing to put up with and the support of society and, and, and um, culture of this is, is, is dismal, so we are on our own. 
But we did learn something from our neuroscience investigation, and this is that architecture properly designed may elicit contemplative state effortlessly. So shouldn't we architects try to design and build spaces that facilitate contemplation? Many will say that this is the job of religion and we should keep ourselves clear of it. In other words, if contemplation or meditation is to happen, people should go where they are formally practiced in their sacred spaces. But what if we move contemplation from the sacred to the secular? What if we use architecture instead of prayer or meditation to induce such states? I would propose that given the great benefits of contemplation, that this is a strategy that deserves some thought and response. I would further propose that this is something architecture ought to do, especially consider the state of our world. Two important caveats are due. One, I'm not here trying to transform the whole built environment into religious spaces structures, only to embed built pedagogies supporting contemplative types of behavior and psychology. And two, we must recognize that we live in diverse societies and therefore contemplative practices and teachings are here to be understood as those common to all faiths. Besides, this is not as ideological or religiously difficult thing to resolve as it may seem. In fact, we have seen that we could get into contemplative state just purely by aesthetic means. We don't need to believe in anything. So we ask this question, Maybe the answer is very simple, like this. By advancing these behaviors, values, and experiences, which I cannot get into it because that's a different part of the research, but I promise this is true. Next, and to conclude now, I will consider two examples super briefly of architecture in an urban space that I believe, I know, because I've been there, offer such opportunities. Let's start with the first Spanish architect my first, my favorite architect, to be honest, Alberto Campo Baeza, um, in the project called Between Cathedrals in Cadiz, in Spain. It is hard to believe that you can help people to practice contemplation by making a parking garage, but there you have it. If you take the ramp on your left, you are brought up to the platform, and if you turn around once, once you get there, suddenly, you have the Atlantic Ocean all for yourself. You are lifted up from the ordinary busyness and noise of the street and catapulted into a state of solitude and contemplation. Notice also the level of reduction, if you wish, abstention of the architectural language that removes all inessential and focuses on what matters, which is connection, or better say, an alignment with something larger, nature, the cosmos, perhaps the transcendent, and in offering this amazing place to any ordinary citizen walking by, it is also an act of giving, an act of charity, of love and compassion. Thus, through design and commitment to illicit contemplation, an ordinary parking garage has become a gate to the extraordinary. And the last example is a transit hub in New York City by architect Santiago Calatrava, next to the 9-11 memorial called the Oculus. See what Suchi says about that one. <laughs> it is the closest to a secular cathedral you will see in New York City, I think, or the world, probably. The stunningly beautiful, angelical, celestial space embraces the thousands upon thousands of people crossing it every day. There is a shopping mall at the bottom, but what's remarkable about the place is that beside walking, there are lo lots of people really looking around and just being in awe with the place looking up at the light, pouring down in an act of contemplation. You can see them in the center there. In fact, it is impossible to go through, the, to go through this space and not being awakened to the present moment. Who has been there? Okay, so we'll see if you agree with that.
Kevin, yeah, you also have much to say there. The dramatic scale and verticality of this space and also its incredible silence and beauty invites contemplation and non-doing, even in the midst of ordinary living. I should add that despite the huge criticism about cost, time delays, and so much more, I myself was brought to tears by this space, which I felt to be, beyond doubt in my case, an act of great love and compassion for the ordinary citizen, a celebration of human dignity, an extraordinary architectural experience that transcended me, at least, a contemplative space. Thank you.